<clears throat> Thank you very much. Good to see a good crowd here again. Um, you know, it's amazing what about 22 years difference it'll make for me anyway, and probably for all of you and for the medical world to look back where I was at that time, which was in, I was at a conference in uh, Fort Worth, Texas that Dr. Reardon had sent me to on biooxidative therapies. Dr. Charlie Farr was an innovative doctor in Oklahoma City and he had sponsored this conference. And I heard Dr. Robert Rowan talk about what I thought seemed like a fairly strange but interesting procedure where the patient's blood was taken and it was basically put into a chamber and exposed to ultraviolet light and then it was infused back into the patient in order to fight infection. And at that time I thought, well, you know, we've got antibiotics. You know, we're doing vitamin C at the clinic. I kind of thought that seemed pretty, pretty like that would be enough at the time. And uh, I didn't really think it was that big of a deal. And I thought it seemed like a fairly clumsy procedure to do. And people might get freaked out by having their blood removed and put back in. And so I just kind of blew it off. And here we are. <clears throat> 22 years later, and look at how the world has changed. How many of you have heard about MRSA? Yeah, uh, that's pretty scary. People are afraid to almost go into the hospital. C. diff, another type of chronic infection that you can get there. How many of you saw the news last night about chicken? That women who have recurrent bladder infections may have a form of E. coli that has become resistant to antibiotics due to the antibiotics that's being used in the chicken feed. And I wrote an article in our Health Hunter, uh, I think in May, on how this, the antibiotics in the, uh, in the livestock feed may be creating all kinds of resistant strains of bacteria that the antibiotics are not working so well for. And this evidence for that, this is kind of a, I was trying to get a hold of one of the uh, infectious disease doctors to consult about a patient. And I called his office and all I could get was nurses who were doing, inf you know, from the infusion center. Evidently they must be doing a lot of IV antibiotics because what happens is when the regular oral antibiotics fail, you have to go to the, to the intravenous antibiotics and, and oftentimes you'll be on them for a long time. And at the end of my presentation, I'm going to go over a case that's, that's in our newsletter this month about a gentleman who's been on infusions of antibiotics every 35 days for the last 12 years for an infection that he could not get over, that uh, we were able to give him some help. So what, what am I talking about here? Uh, interestingly enough, it's just simply talking about light. It's about something that we're all familiar with and we don't think of it as a healing modality and yet it's actually used quite often in modern medicine. If, you're, if your baby happens to have an elevated bilirubin, looks a little yellowish, they'll put the baby in the blue light and we don't, you know, no one thinks twice about that. And so, uh, so the blue light can be an effective way of helping to reduce the excessive uh, bilirubin. The, uh, the use of this ultraviolet light actually was, uh, was written about in a book that came out, I think it was about 15 or 20 years ago into the light, but it, was, it, it received almost no, no attention because again, people didn't think it was necessary. We have antibiotics, but now we're in a different time to where antibiotics aren't quite doing the job that they're supposed to be doing. So uh, what we're, what we find here is that this doctor, uh, Dr. Finson, was a, uh, uh, the, the man that did all the research on ultraviolet light, using it as a treatment for, for various medical conditions, in this case uh, for, for, for lupus. And so just by shining a red light onto a patient with lupus, uh, they're able to, to get some, some results. For I'd like to actually do a demonstration for you today. And I'm gonna to have our CEO, Brian Reardon, come up and he has 
kindly volunteered to be uh, uh, a patient who receives an ultraviolet blood irradiation. So this will be a good chance for us to transition into that while I switch over. And Nicole is our, is our head nurse, and she's going to come up and start the IV. Brian, thank you very much for Pleasure. being willing to, to do this for us. Part of what I wanted to do today is to give you a sense for what this treatment is and what it looks like, what it does, and to kind of feel comfortable about it. And so Nicole has all the things together. Here's our IV pole. And basically what we're going to do is take a small amount of Brian's blood uh, and, and this is a completely closed loop system. None of the materials are ever used again. They're, they're sterilized, uh, they're, they're fresh, new, sterile. They're not used ever again. And we're gonna take a small amount, about 35 cc's. And this is one of the things that's completely different from what I saw 22 years ago. Because 22 years ago, whole blood was being used in a larger amount. And what we have found since then is that if you use whole blood, you don't get very good penetration of the ultraviolet light into the blood. So you don't get the, the therapeutic benefits. They weren't getting the same therapeutic, therapeutic benefits that we're getting now with actually less blood and easier to do. And so uh, we use saline and uh, uh, Nicole will use a small butterfly needle to pull out the 35 cc's of blood, put it into the saline, and then run it through the ultraviolet light chamber. Okay, so I'll just kind of walk you through. I just prime the tubing, it's just normal saline. So at the beginning of the infusion, you'll just get a little bit of normal saline. That's what they rehydrate patients with in the hospital. Um, okay. So it's just like the other IVs that we do here. Um, we use the, like Dr. Ron said, the small butterfly needle. Um, stays in your arm so that you'll keep your arm straight the whole time um, and it takes about 35 to 45 minutes for the infusion. A lot of patients ask me if it's if it's like a dialysis unit. Um, I tell them yes and no. You're infusing your blood product back into you but it's not a closed loop, it's not a continuous loop. We actually pull the blood out, inject it into the bag, and then give it right back to you. So it's not like dialysis because it's not continually pulling blood out and cleaning it at the same time while it's infusing. Okay, so then we just, we stick one time um, with the butterfly needle. We pull up about 30 to 35 cc's of blood, which is just a little bit over an ounce. Um, and then after that, I'll inject it uh, into the bag and infuse it back to him. And then this is, um, I'm done pulling up the blood, so now I'll hook him directly up to the line that I primed with normal saline. <laughs> I want you to all notice that when the blood comes out of Venus blood, it's, it's a little bit darker because your body has already extracted oxygen from it. And just the process of putting the uh, putting the blood back into the saline, notice how much redder it becomes because you're, for one thing, you're oxygenating the blood. And then we take one extra step that I learned from Dr. Frank Schallenberger, who has been using oxygen as therapy for many years. Yeah, you can use a food grade based, pharmaceutical grade food grade based uh, hydrogen peroxide that you can. Uh, this one, first one is the magnesium and the manganese. We use uh, a little bit of mag magnesium and manganese, <coughs> and you told them about we, we heparinize everything so there's no chance of blood clots occurring. Then the other reason we put the manganese and mag magnesium in is that small amount of uh, peroxide it does have a little bit of a pro-oxidant effect. You don't want to irritate the veins, and so the manganese will increase the production of a, an antioxidant within the blood to reduce the irritation of the veins. And this one's the peroxide. And then when you put the peroxide in, I wish I could have the camera here, but as it, as it gets in, it turns the blood from that dark to a very nice cherry red see how color as it oxygenates. So this is the first step that we have found reduces the, uh, what we call the Kirchheimer reaction, 
when people do get this treatment, you are actually killing whatever viruses, bacteria, or germs might be in your bloodstream at that time. The basic idea is, is that is inactivated or killed and then run through the UV light to further uh, inactivate it. At the same time, the light activates the immune system and you put it back into your own bloodstream. You now have basically a personalized vaccination. But further activating your immune system against whatever infections are in your particular body at the time. So it's a very personalized uh, anti-infection care approach. So I'm going to, you can watch, now the rest of, no, it's going to get kind of boring here for Brian because he's just going to sit there and receive it, but really it's just drips in at, a, at about a, over about 25 minutes. So now let's go back to my lecture here to kind of put this all in perspective. There's the little baby with the blue light getting the bilirubin. And so uh, this is the father of modern phototherapy, and he found that certain wavelengths of light can be beneficial and have an effective medical e uh, benefit. And so he was able to cure a form of autoimmune disease called lupus vulgaris. And this is what's interesting about this therapy. Yes, it's effective against infections, but we're finding it's also effective against autoimmune diseases. Is that because it changes the way the immune system is responding to itself? Or is it because the, the autoimmune system itself is a hidden infection? Dr. Reardon oftentimes thought that the body was smarter than that to just attack itself for no reason. He sometimes believed that there was an infection that the basis of most autoimmune disease, but that modern medicine had not identified what the infection was and had not found a way to get rid of it. This may be one way to approach uh, a number of different autoimmune diseases, which I'll be talking about here in just a second. The use of light as therapy is not that foreign to us as, we, as you start to think about it. I'm sure most of you have heard about these blue lights. If you get sad, you can put, you can put these, these, the, the blue light on, and it'll, it'll improve your mood. Seasonal affective disorder occurs more often during the winter when you have less exposure to sunlight. And so you can get full spectrum lights and spend a certain amount of time each day to improve your mood. There are, are more of these uh, red lights that are coming out that are being used. This is a laser LED therapy that's being used for all kinds of wound healing, uh, joint pain, skin re rejuvenation. And I saw a full page ad in the paper a couple days ago for neuropathy using a infrared uh, light to help heal that. And you wonder, well, what is it doing? Well, here is this uh, Dr. Harry Whelan, who's a professor of pediat pediatric neurology, is saying that uh, for wounds, the skin and muscle cells grow in cultures that have been exposed to the LED infrared light 100 to 150 to 200 percent faster than control cultures not stimulated by the light. Part of what we think is going on is that the light itself modulates the inflammatory response. I'm not going to go into all the various details, but inflammation is a very complex response that your body has to any kind of wound, any kind of infection, injury, uh, stress. The body will ignite uh, an inflammatory response in order to uh, orchestrate your immune system and to direct it to where the problem is. The problem, though, beyond, above and beyond that, is that in modern times, due to dietary factors, stress factors, uh, toxins in the environment, that the inflammatory response has gone out of control. We now, if you, if you stop and think about it, name one disease, one modern disease that does not have some kind of inflammation involved in it. I usually refer to them as the itis diseases, whether you're talking about dermatitis, colitis, arteritis, arthritis, uh, neuritis. They're all diseases of excess inflammation. And so light may be a way of balancing the inflammatory response. And this is part of what we think is happening with using the, uh, the ultraviolet light as a way of helping autoimmune diseases. So I, wanted, I wanted all of you to see that it's, it's a pretty straightforward, relatively simple. You do have to have trained personnel they have to know what they're doing. They have to practice good sterile technique. They're using a few medicines. They're using a little bit of heparin. They're using some minerals. So they have to do it right. 
But beyond that, it's not such a complex procedure that it can't be done in the office. And we, uh, once we started doing this and people found out about how effective it was, we had to get our second machine because it turns out there are a lot of people walking around with some kind of chronic infection, whether you're talking about in chronically infected gums or some kind of a chronic skin infection, chronic prostatitis, uh, gingivitis, uh, and, and then, then you start getting into the septicemias, uh, sinusitis, that's becoming a big problem. People who get uh, chronic sinus infections and can't get over them. What about the hidden infections such as Epstein-Barr virus, chronic fatigue syndrome, there's, there's really a, a Lyme disease. There are a number of chronic infections, HIV, that people need help with. And oftentimes, the standard uh, antibiotic therapy or antiviral therapy is not quite sufficient. Now, this is not something that we just dreamed up. It's actually based upon 80 years of research. There are over 200 published medical studies. Uh, we do know that this improves the flow characteristics of blood. It strengthens the immune response. As I showed you, it improves oxygenation of the blood. It has this antibacterial, antiviral effect that has been well documented. And there is growing worldwide interest. Now, there is growing interest in the United States as well. But around the world, there are uh, over 3,000 doctors in Europe alone that are using this therapy. And we had someone come in who's from Europe, and they said, oh yeah, we know about this. Uh, a lot of the doctors use this. And uh, Dr. Nika Rova, who's our, our scientist, chief scientist here, uh, comes from Russia, and, and uh, there, I think Nina was able to find, was it about 60 studies out of the Russian literature on just this therapy alone. Harvard Medical School, Northwest, Northwestern Hospital are beginning to study this once again as we find ourselves being faced with more and more uh, infections that are not responding to conventional therapy or that take forever to respond to conventional therapy. Generally, you are free of side effects when you do this. However, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when, when, the, uh, when the, uh, you activate your immune system against the infection and you, you're killing off more of whatever infection you've got, you might have a little bit of what's called a Herx reaction, where your, bo your body's your body cannot take out the garbage quite fast enough, and so you have a buildup of some uh, of what we call die-off organisms, and so you feel kind of fluish uh, for maybe that day. But most people find that they do quite well following the, uh, the treatment. Again, this is not new. This is the Monday, June the 13th, 1949 cover issue of Time magazine. And one of the big stories in this magazine was about ultraviolet blood irradiation. It actually enjoyed a high level of acceptance back then because that was before antibiotics came out. And I don't know about you, but my mom uh, worked in a pharmacy. And I think when I was a kid, if I even sniffled a little bit, she would talk to the pharmacist and I'd be put on, on uh, chloromycetin and various forms of antibiotics. Because the, the theory back then, or the feeling back then that was that antibiotics were, had kind of like saved mankind from all infections. How many of you kind of remember that? Or maybe, I don't know, maybe some of you, uh, that, is, that was before your time. But I know my mom, even to this day, if, if you get sick, got to get an antibiotic. And then we know now that really antibiotics are probably being overused, and not only in livestock, but uh, my brother, who's a farmer, well, he tells me that the number one selling pharmaceutical agent in a drugstore are the various types of antibiotics that are being prescribed. And so uh, it's partly because of our faith in them, but that same faith has resulted in what many doctors and specialists believe is an overuse, and thus we have this problem of uh, resistant strains. But because they were so effective in the early stages of their use, uh, we were able to uh, really achieve a lot, and uh, there was a great hope that all the major infections would just kind of go away. But it turns out that bacteria and viruses and, and other microscopic organisms, they evolve too. They adapt to their environment as well, and so they're adapting to the, uh, to the antibiotics, and uh, the number of really new antibiotics 
that have come out recently is actually pretty small. So there's a, there's a major concern that at some point in time, we're gonna, we're gonna get to that stage where we're not able to uh, adequately treat some of the you know, regular infections that people have. I think we're there with MRSA. So this is where UBI enters as a viable alternative to antibiotic therapy, using light as a natural antibiotic. So if we looked at the, at the spectrum of light, uh, you, can see, you can see here where the, uh, where the ultraviolet range is, and I'm sure you're all familiar with UVB. That's what gives you a sunburn if you're out in the sun very long. Uh, UVA is an imo immune immodulator. It, it, it's what we think that component of ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet light is what we think uh, does something to the immune system. It's not quite clear, and that's part of the research that we're doing here is to understand a little bit better what happens to the immune system as a result of being exposed to the UVA. But we think the UVA is the therapeutic part that helps people with autoimmune disease. The UVC over here is the germicidal aspect of ultraviolet light. And I think there's even just a general sense, if people get sick, there's a sense that maybe I need to go out and spend some time in the sun. Uh, prior to the antibiotic era, if you had tuberculosis or some kind of chronic infection, you were sent to where? A solarium. You were put out in the sun uh, to sit for many hours a day. Um, part of that response may be that you increased your vitamin D levels, and that's also a good thing. But also part of it is that the sun itself was having some kind of a immune modulating effect. People wonder, is this FDA approved? And, and yes, it is. There is one form of, of phototherapy which uses UV light and, and a special chemical that they inject for T cell lymphoma. Uh, we're not injecting any special chemicals other than a, a small amount of peroxide to improve the oxidation. The FDA, however, has uh, okayed the machine that's being used uh, for this for this particular procedure. The American Cancer Society has approved uh, ultraviolet blood irradiation for the administration and treatment of T-cell lymphoma involving the skin. And there are clinical trials looking at immune system diseases such as uh, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, transplanted organ rejection, and graft-versus-host disease. So again, where we think it's doing the most good, though, and what we seem to be emphasizing more often than not here at the clinic is the role of the UBI as a means of treating people with a chronic infection that's not getting well otherwise. And so uh, inside the, the chamber, there are actually three bulbs. And we have the choice of either making it two of the UVC bulbs and one UVA, or we can make it two UVAs and one UVC. And so the way we make that decision is that if the patient is predominantly working with some kind of an infection, we're going to use two UVC bulbs. If they're working predominantly with an autoimmune disease like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or some other uh, autoimmune problem, we're going to use two of the UVAs, but we still use uh, at least one UVC. Because even with an autoimmune disease, as I mentioned earlier, there's still suspicion that there may be an underlying infection involved in that. The basic treatment is that the light inactivates the pathogens that's in your blood, in your blood, it's kind of like your pathogens that's causing an immune response. And once, that's, once they're inactivated and reinfused back into the body, they are now susceptible to the, to the uh, white blood cells, identifying them and then hunting them out throughout the rest of the body. So what are some of the germs that have been shown to be killed at this level of light? Uh, the bovine diarrhea virus, pseudo, pseudo rabies virus, gastroenteritis, vesicular stomatitis, canine, canine provovirus, and then uh, HIV. Uh, there's some exciting research going on in that area as well. Staphylococcus epidermidis, Staphylococcus aureus, that's the, the uh, staph uh, uh, resistant type. Uh, e. coli, and then the Bacillus cereus. And there's actually many, many more. It's, it's, these are the ones that have been identified so far. But in a sense, it doesn't matter what kind of infection you have. There, there is no resistance to ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light will have that killing effect upon whatever virus or whatever bacteria 
is in your system. Some of the other benefits is that it gets more oxygen to your organs. There's generally people report that they feel better as a result of having UBI. It dilates your blood vessels. You get better circulation. You have decreased viscosity of the blood. Again, a way of improving circulation. There's an increased number of red blood cells being produced, decreased platelet adhesiveness, and improved oxygen supply. And these are documented in this, in this report. So there appears to be, when you do a UBI, a kind of cascade of healing. You're not only just inactivating the germ, but you're doing something to the immune system to activate it against that particular germ. So you may be modifying the, the membrane of the various components of the, uh, of the blood. Uh, that then changes the functional properties of those cells and they're able to either take in oxygen better or to eliminate certain substances better. S clearly there seems to be some improvement in the immune response to, in general, but in specific to whatever infection your body's in fighting. So it's got the direct bactericidal effect and it's got the changes in the functional trends in all parts of the immune system. Here are some of the autoimmune diseases. I think I mentioned these earlier, lupus, MS, People with allergies are reporting that their sinuses are better, they're, they're draining better, uh, they're having fewer infections. Mm -hmm. Asthma can be helped, uh, chronic allergic rashes, uh, poison ivy, who have people who hyper respond to poison ivy, and then rheumatoid arthritis. So the metabolically active T cells and the immune cells seem to absorb the light, which we are calling biophotons, better than just ordinary body cells, and this, this can either uh, change the way the T cells are responding or if, they're, if some of them are over responding it may actually be eliminating certain elements of the immune system that's over responding. So the reason that we, uh, we have people, uh, well, why we do the dilution and this was, a, this was a major change and was one of the reasons why I thought it was now time to, to look into this for the Reardon Clinic is that when the when it first came out, whole blood was being used. And unfortunately, whole blood is pretty thick. And when you try to shine light through the whole blood, it only penetrates 30 microns. So that can, uh, that can leave a lot of surface area of blood cells not being treated. So we're, we're only putting 35 to 40 cc's of, uh, of the blood into the 250 cc's of the saline. And there's some advantages, less clotting, less nursing time, less chance of problems. But the main reason is the blood gets more light. So uh, let me just show you, uh, this, this was the, 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 the fellow that, uh, that made this discovery tried to illustrate it by talking about King Kong. And he said, if you look at the Empire State Building, it's about a thousand feet high, and if you were to put whole blood in, only if this were the equivalent of a bag of whole blood, only the top 30 feet of that amount of blood would get treated by the light. And the bottom 970 feet wouldn't. So, so basically the people who were getting the whole blood treatments, they were getting some benefit but they were not really getting a full penetration of light into the blood. And so, so the, the uh, testing was done uh, on various different types of samples and different dilutions, and it was discovered that if we would use uh, a 12% blood dilution, in other words, 88% 88% saline, 12% blood, 99.9% .9 of the UV light would get be absorbed by the blood. So that's probably the major advance on this. Our, our intent here today was to give you kind of a taste of what this is about. We have a really good article in our Health Hunter, which is also online, but we have many references uh, in terms of the research that's being done. So that's a good source for references. Um, and then I want to also just show you what the, the, this is called the Doctor's UBI, DRS UBI. Dot com. And when you go to Doctors UBI, you'll see uh, kind of a, a general discussion of what the other name that's being used for this is biophotonic therapy. 
What is it? What does it do? What are its advantages? What side effects might you expect? A short history, some testimonials. It even has the little Time Magazine article in there. It has 125 published studies on the website. So for those of you that want to actually dive into some of the research on the various things that this is being used for, here are the studies right here. There's a section for uh, frequently asked questions. There's a, a listing of all the diseases that it's been used for. For example, fibromyalgia, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, asthma, allergies, rheumatoid arthritis, heart disease. That's the one we haven't used a lot for, but theoretically, by additional oxy oxygenation to the tissues, you can reduce angina. Uh, it's also known that uh, people who have chronic gingivitis and other chronic infections that are elevating their CRP, they're more prone for heart disease, so this may be cutting down the infectious component of, of uh, heart disease. Cancer is probably the one that we, is, is most exciting to us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is an indication for this, for a, a form of T-cell lymphoma. Well, we've been using it in other patients with lymphoma and having some very positive effects. Uh, chronic respiratory infections, non-healing wounds. Here's the staph infections or MRSA, any kind of viral infection. I know around the country, people with hepatitis B are finding that this works very well for them but even peripheral vascular disease, and here's a, a discussion also for HIV AIDS. So I called the number on the bottom of the pamphlet and have had four treatments and am enjoying a much better quality of life. I took this technology to uh, Togo, West Africa about a year and a half ago and I encountered a patient there who appeared to be suffering from uh, an acute rabies infection. Uh, there was no medicines currently at the missionary hospital that could help him and uh, I offered to treat him with biophotonic therapy and uh, after three treatments uh, he had a miraculous recovery and was discharged from the hospital later that week. Early January I couldn't uh, walk more than about a hundred feet without being completely out of breath. I was just about to get a, a handicap sticker for my car and I got the first treatment here and lo and behold, I had tremendous energy. I could start to walk. I came in and received a UBI, and that night I was laying in bed, and the side of my face just started really tingling, and the pain went away, and after that I had no more pain with the shingles, and it healed up within, I would say, three, four days. I had an awful pain in my legs. When I walked, I uh, couldn't hardly make it. I was with my friend and I said, this is like a miracle. I can walk three miles and I don't even have to stop. And my daughter said, Mom, you're really looking good these days. She says, your eyes are so blue and I can do all the things that I always wanted to do without pain. And then just one time and then I was just gone. To me, it was like a miracle, you know, it's especially in our face and stuff. I feel great. I feel very confident that my cancer is healing. Basically, I would recommend this therapy for anyone who has cancer of any type. There are no ill side effects. I'm going to show you just a couple more. This is another report uh, from Dr. Schallenberger. Uh, Dr. Schallenberger has worked with oxygen therapies, and he was talking about a lady that he described as a mess. She had a tachycardia of 140. That's really beating pretty fast. <clears throat> 33 breaths per minute, fever of 103. Her oxygen saturation was way down. As he says, it was just ridiculous. Gave her one 60 cc treatment. You can use higher amounts of blood, and he does. And he adds uh, a bit of ozone uh, to his uh, UBI. Uh, and she had a total turnaround within 24 hours. Everything got better. It was remarkable. She was cured within just three days. He says that UBI does something different. It definitely does something very good and very different from ozone therapy. Ever since then, I, I, I see using the two of them together. Together they can multiply the benefits of healing in many of my patients. And that's why we don't have ozone available here, but we found that the food grade hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, it breaks down into water and oxygen, and it seems to have a similar benefit as the, the ozone therapy. Just wanted to just take a minute. The case that we have in the, uh, 
uh, Health Hunter is, is really pretty darn dramatic because this is a 70-year-old man who had come with a, a chronic uh, bacteria in his system that every 35 days he had to go in for intravenous antibiotics for a full 10 days. He would be at the hospital every day for 10 days, every 35 days. Uh, when it was active, it would cause severe inflammation, swelling, fevers, and skin lesions. And if, if it would proliferate, the doctors told him he would die from a condition called sepsis. He had battled this unknown bacterial assailant for more than nine years before it was identified in September of 2011 as <laughs> Burkholder pseudomalii, which is a type of uh, pseudomonas. The bacteria is so rarely found in the North American continent that only four to five cases are reported annually in the United States. And it was, gra it was gradually becoming uh, resistant to his antibiotic therapy. So he could only be given very powerful uh, IV antibiotics, including uh, this vancomycin and um, meropium, which I had not even heard of before. So, he pretty much assumed that this was what he was going to, uh, he also had diabetes, so that compromised his immune system. So he was brought to the uh, Reardon Clinic by a friend of his who thought that maybe this might be an answer for him. He was very skeptical. He had been sick for so long, but he was willing to give it a try. And uh, uh, we did our normal uh, workup on him. He did have some nutrient levels that we needed to correct but we began doing the uh, UBI twice a week for about the first three or four weeks. But even after the second treatment, he was able to breathe much better. His sinus passage cleared, and this, we find this working very well for people with chronic sinus infections. His vision became sharper. He continued, and then after the fifth treatment, uh, he was able to come, he was in addition to doing the IV antibiotics at the hospital, he did daily antibiotics. So he had been on antibiotics orally for nine years. So he was able to come off his daily antibiotics without getting an infection. And as of last count, and really this was based about a week and a half ago, so for the past, I would say about 160 days now, he has been completely free of infection without having to go back for the IVs or having to take oral antibiotics. So, uh, I think that's probably our most dramatic case of taking someone who had otherwise a life-threatening illness that required uh, medical intervention. We were able to uh, help him. Now he's no longer doing the UBIs. He's basically he's done. I think he did about 12 altogether, and uh, I, he's he. Uh, we're on call to him. If he ever he did get any infection, he's to come in to have a UBI. But otherwise. One of the benefits of this is that because it is a vaccination-like response, we have built his immune system up. We have helped his immune system recognize that infecting agent, and now he's got an adequate immune response to where he's not getting sick. So that's different than even the IV vitamin C therapy that we do. IV vitamin C is a great way to help your immune system, but it doesn't teach it to be more effective against a specific infection like this particular therapy does. So uh, with that, I think I'll stop and take some questions. Judy Norelter, does this help the post? Yes, and uh, many people who have, I don't know how many of you know about what's going on, but it seems to me that among all the other epidemics that we have in our land right now, uh, that pe there seems to be more people getting shingles. And I don't know if it's because there is uh, environmentally something that's pulling people's immune systems down. It could be the fact of this, this uh, the fact that uh, there are more resistant strains of infection that the body's having to fight. But for whatever reason, we have a lot of cases of shingles coming in now, and, I, and there's a lot of information now about people should go out and get your shingles vaccine, vac vaccination, which I'm, I'm not against if that's what, you know, I think it might be useful, but even that is only 60% effective. If you get shingles, though, and you want a quick way to help your body fight it, this appears to be very good. Now, for the people that have post-herpetic neuralgia, these are folks who had their shingles. The shingles persisted, then finally got better, and what's supposed to happen is the shingles pain, which can be pretty bad, is supposed to go away. But in a certain percentage of folks, 
it doesn't. And they, they have what's called post-herpetic, her, herpes, herpes simplex is, is uh, the family, uh, it's really herpes zoster that causes the, uh, the shingles. And so the post-herpetic neuralgia is the, is the persistent of, persistence of the virus or the inflammation from the virus in the nerve causing a chronic pain in that area. Is that what you're talking about, ma'am? Yeah. yeah, and so we've had several cases that have come in and had this done and they have had success. I will say, I don't, again, I don't limit my therapy to this alone. Very often I'll do B12 shots, improve vitamin D, you know, just generally check people over and try to get them in tip, tip top shape to get all of their healing faculties working for them. But certainly this is a modality that I would include in their therapeutic plan. I think a lot of people believe that it is an infection that's persisting. You haven't totally gotten rid of the virus. The virus is, it's, it, what, what happens with shingles is that when you had, uh, when you had your, your, uh, your chicken pox as a child, the, the virus was there and then the body's immune system got it under control and it went into a dormant state. What happens in shingles is in certain nerve roots, in, in certain areas of the bodies that we call dermatomes, it will reactivate. And so you have like chicken pox in a specific area. And it can become infected and other problems. Uh, so post-herpetic neuralgia may be that the chicken pox is no longer actively infecting. You're not getting the little sores, but it's not completely inactivated. It's still there in a slightly active state causing inflammation and pain in the nerve root. How many treatments? Well, again, what we tell people is I usually tell folks if, if it's a serious inf infection, inflammation, like this gentleman that I just gave you his case history, he required 12. Uh, a lot of people I'll say if you've got a sinus infection, why don't you think in terms of doing four. With post-herpetic neuralgia, I would say it may take more like six or longer, and that's in conjunction with whatever else nutrient-wise that we're going to do to try to help get your immune system rehabilitated. And the cost of this is about, uh, it's $170 to do just a straight ultraviolet blood irradiation. And then we, when we add the peroxide, it's another $30. So the peroxide is an optional thing. I don't, I don't insist that people have to have that. The people who have used the peroxide generally request it again. They, they feel like it, it does better for them than just the UBI alone. And Medicare does not pay for this, no. So what else is new? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about uh, fungus in the toenails? Toe Boy, I th I, there. The question is, would would this treat fungus in the toenails? It does treat fungal infections. Like we have a lot of people who have chronic candida overgrowth syndrome, and they are reporting help with this. Toenail fungus is a little different story because you can knock out the fungus but it takes another six months for, of the nail to grow out before you get the healthy nail back. I don't know if I would rely upon this alone for that. There's some other treatments that can be equally effective and less expensive. So you could use it for that, but if you had some kind of a systemic fungus, then I would definitely say this would be a good idea. I'm just wondering uh, if you've had anybody with pyroluria that's been treated with this. The thing is um, that some people say it's genetic, other people say, uh, no, they think it's really started originally with a virus or bacterial infection, which I tend to kind of think it is. I've been following uh, a family member as well as um, a first cousin, and they've both been diagnosed with this. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, Lyme disease is a suspicion. So would something like this maybe be something to get to the underlying cause of the pyroluria, which might <coughs> Even things out. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I remember Dr. Reardon when he was still alive. We went to a medical meeting and we ha we were sitting at a table with an infectious disease doctor, and the news had just come out about H. pylori. You know, it used to be thought that ulcers and gastritis were just due to stress, right? You know, you you had a stressful job or something, and and you would get an ulcer, and then it was discovered that there was an actu actual bacteria in the the ulceration that was causing the, uh, the actual ulcer. And that to really get rid of it, you needed to take an antibiotic. And so I remember <clears throat> Dr. Reardon saying, gee, I wonder, 
if down the road we'll find out that a large number of the chronic conditions that people deal with are due to infections. Take heart disease. You know, we used to think heart disease was just cholesterol. Well, of course, that theory is pretty much, uh, there are still people that think it's cholesterol, but actually you can almost always culture out uh, mycoplasma or chlamydophilia from the plaque. It's an infection, and people who have gingivitis are much more prone to getting heart attacks, or people that have their immune system suppressed, they're more prone to getting the infection in their plaque and causing more inflammation and proliferation of the plaque. So, so I think a lot of things that we thought were just, you know, we didn't know, you know, that it was just bad luck that you got this disease. Now we're beginning to see, no, it's your immune system's not functioning as well. Now I very often see people who have low nutrient status, they're more prone to their immune system not being as well, then that leads them to get an infection and of course stress can affect your immune system too. So all these things kind of interact together. And so when we go about the business of trying to help people improve their health, we're not working on just one thing. We're trying to improve their nutrients. We're trying to help them detoxify, get a better diet, reduce their stress, sleep better, get some exercise. This is the holistic approach to building your health up from the ground up. And that's, that's what we sp specialize in here. Curious about your mentioning the vision part of the one patient improving. Yeah, I, yeah, uh, and, and it's interesting. Oxygenation, better blood flow. Remember, the, the word rheology is a, it's a kind of a strange word, but it just means that the flow characteristics of the blood improves. Uh, there's, there's actually quite a bit of research being done on blood viscosity. People who have thick blood are more prone to heart disease and angina and because thick blood means you don't you don't oxygenate it you don't deliver the nutrients to the cells as well and so this seems to it's not a blood thinner but it seems to improve the flow characteristics of the blood so you get better nutrient and oxygen delivery to the to the cells and so that may be why her vision improved Good, good results was hepatitis C. That's actually the, before we actually got our machine, there was a, there was a place down in Oklahoma that uh, I, we were sharing some patients with, and typically I was actually having to send some patients there, and they were getting good results with, uh, with this, a similar type machine. And so we, I can't say we've had a lot of hepatitis C patients, but in the literature, it, sh it shows really good for hepatitis C. It's a virus chronic virus, so yeah, it, it would help that. So does any ultraviolet light reach the blood when you're exposed to the sunlight? Some, not very much. You know, you're, you know, again, it's that same thing that I showed with the Empire State Building. Most of your blood is in the dark, and you're going to get some that's near the surface of the skin. So yeah, that's why I think people kind of instinctively when they're, not always, but a lot of people when they're sick, they'll do a little more sunbathing or they want to heal up. Though, as long as you don't burn, you know, you got to be careful that you don't get too much sun, but, but the right dose of sun can be very helpful. <laughs>